It is a pleasure to be back among so many friends, and thanks to the organizers for making this happen. If we have to be virtual ghosts, at least we are all haunting in good company. My interests this year have focused on Lacan's theory of metaphor, which I envision as a kind of efficient cause and virtuality related to the logic of dreaming. Anyone who has tried to grapple with Lacan's somewhat complicated mathem for metaphor knows that it is not the usual kind of metaphor discussed in university English classes. As Stephanie Swales has recently written, you have to sort out Lacan's many attempts to distance himself from the idea that a metaphor is a way to replace an ordinary word with a clever one, or simply an adaptation of the four terms of logical analogy. Lacan does not relinquish the idea of one signifier replacing another. This, in fact, is a basic action of signifiers. When Lacan reversed Saussure's standard signified over signifier to his own more functional signifier over signified, the idea was to show how the kernel of signification was fundamentally metaphorical. A signifier is a definition of what's on top, but it's a collection of signifiers, of course, and we could, like the standard two-year-old, keep asking what the signified means until we run out of dictionary definitions. Jorge Luis Borges has written that the dictionary is really a circle of self-references and that all libraries are really circular. Lacan agreed, but he wanted to acknowledge this circularity without requiring the need for a meta-language position, a standing above and looking down on the circle to map its shape. One of Lacan's solutions was this complicated-looking mathem, which I will try to unpack. But there are several other important ideas. One is the grounding idea of extremity, the inside-out topology that is broadly represented from the mirror stage on. We are most familiar with this in the form of the Borromeo knot. Projective geometry was discovered in 300 AD by Pappus of Alexandria. It was rediscovered by Girard Desargues and Blaise Pascal in the early 17th century misunderstood and forgotten until the 1800s when it was revived and expanded. Without projective geometry, there would have been no quantum physics or relativity theory. But the 20th century again forgot projective geometry and refers to its rich products as non-Euclidean. This is like calling regular coffee non-decaf, because in fact projective geometry is logically prior to Euclidean geometry. You can derive Euclid from projective geometry, but not the other way around. The theorems of Pappus, Desarg, and the 19th century geometers go beyond Euclid's easy pictorialism and require us to twist and intersect surfaces that have only two dimensions. The real projective plane is akin to Lacan's idea of the real, that is, something that is difficult if not impossible to symbolize. Its resistance is what makes it primary and profound, mathematically, and to some extent, Lacan carried the same resistance into his theory of metaphor. I can't do a whole lot with projective geometry since my mathematical talents are limited, to say the least. But there are two properties of metaphor that make topology more approachable by looking at ways that the category of the uncanny which we encounter both in dreams and in the literature of the fantastic, show how projective geometry is critical to the fundamental operations of the psyche. Projective geometry can be summarized by two properties that we readily see in the Mobius band, Kleinbottle, and Borromeo knot. These are one, self-intersection, and two, non-orientation. To show how projective space works in psychoanalysis, consider Waldo taking a trip around the world. Waldo has suppressed the fact that he has experienced a trauma, which has pushed him into what is equivalent to a dream in relation to the trauma as the real. This is what the unconscious sees when it looks at what we think is waking reality. 
Only an analyst can tell us that we're sleeping. Waldo imagines that he's traveling in Euclidean space, but he's missing half of it. So when he gets back to his starting point, he must invent a second virtuality to complete his journey and resolve the non-orientation he momentarily experienced but couldn't explain. He had seen his double, but dismissed this uncanny encounter. When he completes the trip in his terms, he arrives back at the uncanny situation Magritte has accurately shown us. The latency of his tour is that it has taken 720 degrees to complete 360. Again, Magritte knows exactly how to show this correctly. The mirror preserves this as its interior latency, a thickness that in architecture is what is called poche, hidden spaces found inside walls, in cellars, and attics. These are the places of the dream phantasmagoria. This is a sad situation for the mirror, who must be forced to see the ugly along with the beautiful, the sad along with the sanguine, the horror that it would have to watch without flinching. Once the mirror has an eye, once it is given the power of gazing, as Lacan realized we do give it suddenly at a point in our young lives, it becomes an other like any other other, but with an important distinction. It is another who must watch without moving or flinching, another who is like the subjects strapped in place in Plato's cave, forced to watch shadows projected onto the wall and accept their flat reality for all we are able to know. The uncanny feature of mirrors, after we give them the power to see, is that they endure being nailed to the wall with stoic pain, while the prisoners of Plato's cave are like the dreamer, both of which are immobilized but unaware of their immobilization. They believe themselves to be in a Euclidean world where they are free to move about. Like figures on a fixed ground, they can visit the hidden sides of things they can't see from any one point of view. No problem. If they don't have time to do this, they have the principle that the unseen sides could be seen by someone sometime, and anything left over from human inspection or beyond access can at least be seen by God, as Bishop Barclay advised. The mirror is not so lucky. It knows it is fixed. The mirror we endow with the power of vision makes the earthly sphere into a two-dimensional surface that intersects itself but remembers what has happened, that the return is a twin of departure, and that the mirror has witnessed both events. Thanks to its memory, its latency, it shows the hero returned, but it cannot orient the return as a circle, which would require slicing the globe. As a surface, and only a surface, this globe does not exist. There is no third dimension. The surface that is closed and curved intersects itself but cannot preserve orientation because that would require another space outside, from which we look down to watch this trip around the world. Barclay's God, this position looking down, is what gives the dreamer the feeling of moving free and easy, but we know that the point of the dream is to paralyze the dreamer by parading a world before her eyes. This is a bit like the situation of the movie, The Truman Show, where a single character, Truman, believes that he lives in a pleasant town in Florida. But he is really surrounded by actors and in a set built inside an ecologically isolated dome. He is a dupe, being filmed by devices that outdo Barclay's God to make sure that Truman never discovers the truth. This is Truman's Euclidean dream illusion that like the dream, aims to see how long it can preserve the dupe's imprisonment. The Haunted Mirror Tale, from the 1945 British thriller Dead of Night, shows Truman's paralysis induced by a mirror gifted by a wealthy socialite to her fiancé. The mirror has preserved a traumatic image. Its former owner had murdered his wife in a jealous rage. When the new husband shows up to stand before it, 
This latent image returns from the mirror's non-Euclidean depths. This reverses the normal figure-ground relationship. The new husband becomes the ground and is paralyzed until his wife smashes the mirror. First, let me show how the impossibly complicated mathem for metaphor is actually a map of projective geometry's 2D manifold. It does what Magritte's mirror does in successive operations that use latency in the same way that the dream uses latency to paralyze the dreamer. It is important to remember this paralysis. It is the way the dream defends the dreamer by keeping sleep protected against external stimulation. Dan Collins has written a perceptive essay about Lacan's metaphor mathème. We have to look at the first action carefully, the s over little s prime. This might seem to be a metaphor plain and simple, the replacement of one signifier by another that conceals a hidden or even inaccessible meaning. Collins uses a striking example I need to repeat here. A little girl says, someday I will grow a tooth on my bottom. She cannot imagine, let alone articulate, the idea that she lacks a penis, so the tooth must serve as a metaphor. The tooth is made into a mirror by Lacan's mathème, as a denominator that is pushed down into the signified position by the metaphor tooth, it is inverted to be a numerator in relation to a mystery factor, x. But this x inexplicably disappears. The signifier that is first given one apostrophe, or prime, is given another. This is like giving the signified the third degree as it appears on the right of the equal sign beneath a one and a bar. This is the way that Lacan says that the dictionary's illusionistic pretense of offering us a circle instead of a conclusive definition has been a ruse. We must accept that meaningfulness is not the same as an endless substitution of one meaning for another. Meaningfulness requires latency, and latency begins on the far left of the mathem, when the tooth has, in effect, drowned the penis. The little girl will not be able to realize the meaningfulness of what she has unwittingly said unless she is able to go through a psychoanalytical experience of interpretation. Just as the little girl has held a signifier's head underwater to drown it, the analyst must let it rise to the surface thanks to the buoyancy of the X, which is like the specific gravity of a fluid that allows S prime to rise to the surface. It may seem that the two S primes cancel each other out and disappear, but in fact Lacan has created a mirror with eyes and shown how this mirror has been forced to watch all that has happened to the subject, all the crimes, all the horrors, all the traumas. As with every human subject, these have been suppressed because they cannot be remembered in the same way a mirror might return an optical scene, immediately and without comment. Drowning and rising again from the depths thanks to the creation of a mirror by someone who, like the analyst, must sit still and be mostly silent. All this means that analysis is really metaphor in action. The successful connection between the unconscious on the lower right of the L schema with the upper left portion, the S, is the trip around the world back to Magritte's mirror. I would like to say more about the uncanny mirror. I would in particular like to get into why this painting offers a way to follow up the project that Mladen Dollar has proposed, namely to make the idea of anamorphosis into something that relates to the entire repertoire of the analytical subject. This normally optical trick is important because it shows that latency is central to psychoanalysis.